<laughs> Hi, thank you everyone. Um, I think we can reconvene and, and, and move into the um, report back. Um, we're just we're just going to ask each of our um, breakout groups to to for one person to kind of give a brief three minute summary of the key takeaways from your breakout group. So we can take down these slides actually, since we're not going to be sharing slides for this one. Um, I might first ask um, the for, we can start with the virtual breakouts, and we can do the first room, the climate uh, macro modeling group. I think that was Bob. Sorry, I, was that your group? Um, Oh, Adele, I'm sorry, Adele. Sure, yeah, um, and thanks to all my virtual participants to talk about climate and macroeconomic modeling. Um, we didn't necessarily follow the full script, so apologies if we deviate from the prescribed outline, but um, a, few, a few things in, in not any real particular order. Um, some of the questions that came up for our group participants um, related to macroeconomic forecasts and projections is that for those that use econometric models for their macroeconomic projections, how should they incorporate climate related factors? And this might be in the context of other countries or applications. Um, and what would be the appropriate methods to do that? And what do you do if you don't necessarily have a long time series? for the relevant data to do those um, more standard econometric projections. So those, those question arose. Another question was, what could be the role or example of model intercomparison and improvement projects? So there are a number of these groups, um, perhaps one of the early ones was the Stanford Energy Modeling Forum that convenes modelers um, to look at stylized scenarios of policy and technological futures that help develop these models and identify uh, strengths and weaknesses and, and fruitful directions for growth and, and development of those models. Um, there have arisen similar intercomparison projects in climate science and in agricultural models. And these, these um, meetings of modeling teams, I think can be really fruitful. So maybe there's a question there for the macro modelers. And just to give an example, we talked about agricultural models because that was one of the areas of expertise of our participants. And looking at um, you know, how you model crop productivity in, in a changing climate and how you convert that into economic productivity and how and whether that gets translated into total factor productivity in, in your macroeconomic projections? And then how do you deal with the, the wide variations in crop production and, what, and figure out what drives those also in the context of climate variation? So you're, you're adding a whole, you know, whole new levers of variation and trying to figure out how, how to insert all that. One, one kind of proposed assertion that came up in our group, and. I'm gonna just try this out. It's not necessarily a consensus view, but here it goes. It, it's the perception that the macroeconomic projections, the GDP forecasts in particular that we were talking about yesterday, and the factors that go into determining output very importantly, spatially and sectorally within the United States. And this is gonna be especially true when those factors are driven by climate related considerations and whether it's climate damages or, or transition factors. So all those things that go into those, those inputs to macroeconomics, whether it's labor supply or productivity or capital, there are complicated things behind there. And accordingly, I guess the question we're asking is whether these traditional parsimonious macro models are really going to be well suited to a low carbon and climate disrupted future, and and whether or not it makes sense to try to, um, you know, retrofit those with climate factors, or whether it makes sense to consider new classes of models for macroeconomic projections. And I'm not an, enough of a macroeconomist to know just how inflammatory that possible suggestion is. But I, I'd 
I'm just the reporter here. So, um, <laughs> and then in the category of, of limits and opportunities, we, again, we talked about agriculture. And, and one example in ag models is just like, these are really important for, for farm credit oversight regulators and, and project, projecting productivity in an in important sector. But when you start adding climate in there, everything gets even more crazy complicated. And if you just take livestock, so you might have a relationship of heat and, and livestock production, but with climate, it's not just heat, it's generally it's heat in the nighttime and how often and how, how, in how many nights sequence you've got hot nights. So, so just like adding these new factors, like how do you even do that? And how do you get the right data and so on? And then one final thought is just looking at the example of the creation of shared scenarios. So modelers convene and create like these representative concentration pathways and the shared socioeconomic pathways that the IPCC has developed. And these illustrate narratives of future outcomes. And I guess there's a question of whether stylized macroeconomic now narratives and scenarios might be useful. I realize this is kind of at odds with the idea of forecasting and they are really different exercises, but Perhaps there, there, I guess the question arises, is there any model in this convening of macro modelers to talk about illustrative narratives that might be incorporated in these projections? So I'll stop there. Thank you. Thanks, Adele. Can I now ask the whoever was the self-appointed rapporteur from the in-person breakout on the same topic, the climate macro modeling, um, to, to give your summary, brief summary? It is I. Where? Okay, I wait for the camera to find me. Uh, yes, there I am. Uh, okay, I'm. I'm going to be a bit more brief. So uh, let's see. What did we talk about? One thing we talked about is that um, so, uh, you know, an existing in in uh, the administration's macro modeling framework, supply side factors matter a lot. I mean, they matter a lot. I think economy in general. And so migration is very important and it's not explicitly represented in any of these climate uh, macro modeling connections yet. Um, and probably probably won't be for political reasons, but that's uh, something valuable to, to think about. Um, we had a long discussion about what type of climate data is most uh, useful for kind of macroeconomic modeling. Uh, and in particular, we discussed how correlated events and extremes or estimates of the duration of exposure uh, is, is very valuable. Those are like moments of the distribution of, of, of uh, weather exposure that are really challenging to model. Um, but those are probably moments of the distribution of weather exposure that have the most influence on the economy. So to the extent we could improve our modeling of, of those moments, we'd improve our modeling of the economy. Uh, and we we talked uh, a little bit about some some other things that aren't included in macro models right now, like um, effects on human capital accumulation, which would arguably be very important for economic growth. There's there's very little research on that. Um, the research that exists is is, is is like pretty good in my precip uh, precipitation uh, is uh, <laughs> that was that was a that was a very that was a very Noah moment, <laughs> just like, uh, <laughs> love it. Um, uh, is 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 good, like in my evaluation. But yeah, I, I feel like we just need more need more research on human capital effects of of climate. That's uh, probably very important. Um, and then we had talked about how uh, distributional consequences of the energy transition and of Physical climate damages are really interesting to policymakers, both on like on a spatial and a sectoral basis. Um, it doesn't feel like existing macro models. I might just hazard making a similar suggestion uh, <laughs> that we just throw throw them out, but um, you know, I, I don't think that's I don't think that's going to happen. So maybe it doesn't make sense to have one model. Maybe um, instead we should think about having multiple models, one kind of a main administration model for the net effect 
forecasts, um, and then one that can get more at sectoral or spatial details that could be housed somewhere else. It would, it, it would be, because it's talking about distributions, it um, probably has a more political weight, and so it might make sense to house it you know, somewhere else in the government. That's just me. That's my personal gloss on that. Um, but yeah, yeah, those are the main things we talked about. Uh, Neil and Rita, um, Peter, if, uh, Tara, if there's any, if there's anything I missed, uh, feel free to, to mention that. Great. Thank you. Um, then moving back to the virtual breakouts for this breakout two on modeling economic damages, or um, I think Bob is the yeah. repertoire there. Um, so I think you're going to start to see some commonalities with the previous two groups. Um, in terms of key questions, um, we had a bunch of questions that I think can broadly be put under the category of cascading risk. Um, so if we have you know, d does the idea that aggregate national damages in the U.S. are small align with the fact that we have regional damages that can be quite substantial? Do regional damages, in fact, interact with under, on another so they add up in a super linear way? Um, are compound extremes uh, economically significant at a national scale? Um, are physical tipping points potentially economically significant? So if you, um, for example, have uh, abrupt shift in the North Atlantic subpolar gyre, um, which would have climatic and sea level consequences for Europe, North America, uh, um, Africa. Would that would that be economically significant? Um, we also thought that the distributional lens was really an important lens to bring to all of this much, and maybe it's much more than the aggregate perspective. And so, therefore, you need um, models capable of addressing distributional questions. And yet, as both of the previous rapporteurs already noted, current macro models often lack that needed re regional resolution. Um, and also both macro models and climate damage models often lacked both adequate sectoral resolution and treatment of intersectoral interactions, which are another pathways cascades might happen. Um, we also uh, talked about the um, importance of uncertainty characterization. And again, we mentioned uh, the need to think about higher order moments, not just mean and variance, uh, and the need to think about ambiguity and misspecification as well as quantifiable uncertainty. Um, and also to think about how uncertainty is communicated and not just how it is characterized in, in technical documents. Um, and finally, I think the main new thing we have to add to the discussion so far is we talked a little bit about computing opportunities. Um, so opportunities from open science uh, through sort of modular open systems like Freddy that can bring in modules other from a variety of sources. Um, cloud computing opportunities to bring together large climate and socioeconomic data sets to make it easier to do new uh, climate econometric studies um, and potentially using of AI to help with um, sort of scraping and cleaning new socioeconomic data sets uh, to look at. I think that's... Super, thanks. Um, and then the in-person self-appointed rapporteur for the second group on modeling damages. Was that? Sure. Hello. Uh, yes, uh, my name is Dan Liang from uh, NSF. Uh, so our group had a very rich discussion on this topic. Um, and uh, there, I'm going to report on just a few key uh, takeaways, I think. Um, uh, why is that we recognize that a lot of models that we currently use uh, don't have uh, important feedbacks. Uh, so uh, that's really, uh, it's difficult to capture the, um, the changes in human be behaviors in response to uh, either the single disaster event or to um, long-term uh, climate change. Also, it doesn't, um, capture the, uh, the reaction from the different uh, the sectors to the impact of the climate change. So as a result, it's very difficult to uh, derive the, uh, the actionable policies or, or programs uh, based on those uh, very aggregated um, uh, models. So one uh, possible uh, solution or opportunity is to to develop a more 
uh, flexible models that can uh, really link to each other or uh, uh, perhaps uh, some new classes of models that are better suited to uh, answer some of the questions that uh, we're interested in. Um, I think we have mentioned that there's some new uh, research on uh, embedded models or agent-based models that definitely uh, has a potential to, uh, to play a role uh, in this space. Uh, the other takeaway is that uh, when you look at the, uh, especially the impact from the extreme uh, events like hurricanes or flooding or wildfires, and uh, we just don't have enough uh, historical record that we can use to train a lot of uh, empirical models. Uh, so uh, projecting uh, their frequency and, um, and intensity into the future uh, we feel that uh, there's uh, additional research required to look at the impact of climate change on uh, those uh, events uh, end up happening at the same time, concurring, uh, concurrence, or uh, cascading effects. It, uh, one disaster leads to another and uh, end up creating a much bigger effect on the uh, US economy. Uh, and uh, abroad. And also there's uh, also some interest in look at how um, uh, the, those extreme events uh, become more clustered uh, either in the temple or spatial uh, dimension. So they happen to you know, impact on certain part of the United States or uh, the space between those events. You know, we have seen the uh, Puerto Rico that Got hit by hurricanes back and back, and you know that is definitely something uh, creating additional challenges to those committee while they were uh, recovering from the previous one. Um, the the last thing I want to mention is that we also recognize there's uh, already a lot of models out there. Uh, in addition to what we discussed uh, in the past two days, uh, but they are very specific to either uh, individual sectors like energy or agriculture or, uh, or food systems. So perhaps there's opportunity to, you know, bring those kind of uh, uh, model modelers together to compare and see what, uh, uh, what we can learn from each other. Uh, and also related to that, we also already have some models uh, really have a, uh, more granular uh, spatially. So there's models uh, for regional uh, economy or even for certain uh, watershed. So, uh, but within that uh, region, there's a lot of uh, uh, um, different industries or uh, different features being uh, modeled. So, uh, so we're hoping that we can um, uh, really uh, find some kind of synergy uh, between those different models uh, in order to move uh, the conversation forward. Thank you. Thank you. So for our virtual rooms, we combined um, breakouts, breaker rooms uh, three and four. So Emmy will, will be the rapporteur for both of those. Okay, um, our discussion was uh, a fairly small group and um, it was a very interesting discussion, but it's sort of um, strayed away a little bit from the main topics that we've been talking about here. I thought it was a very interesting, uh, but different perspective on some of these issues. So the conversation really focused on the role of community um, in some of the questions that we're discussing. I mean, we're, we're discussing them in, in a very quantitative way, um, thinking about aggregated statistics, either at the national level or at the regional level. But you know, of course, these are real people who are involved, um, and you know, real people who are who are part of communities, and those communities are being affected by uh, climate change and by the energy transition. So that was sort of one focal point. Um, there was an emphasis on the connection that people have to places um, and to the possibility of uh, solutions um, to climate change and the energy transition that help uh, support communities, um, and in addition, on the idea that. Um, some of these solutions should focus not just on disaster recovery, but also on forms of proactive resilience building. Uh, and, and there was also an emphasis on, on the idea that 
many of the issues we're discussing have have broader impacts beyond the economic impacts that that we're focused on measuring. Thanks, Emmy. And then for the the third in person group, um, what what was that? The energy transition group. Uh, so I am presenting. Uh, we had a great discussion. I have to say, I only learned at the very end that I am the one uh, <laughs> presenting, and I wasn't I wasn't able to connect with everybody. So hopefully, I, I characterize uh, folks' um, contributions correctly. Uh, so let's start with the basic premise that under current law, what if we project that over the next decade we go from sixty percent of electri electricity generation from non renewables to twenty percent? So how do we incorporate that transition uh, into economic projections? An important input, uh, so maybe the basic way to do it is that an important input, uh, renewable electricity, falls in price and then uh, becomes relatively cheaper to another input uh, that is a substitute non-renewables. So we have basic models that that you know tell us what to do with that news. Um, I think a big part of this is that the assumption is that the that the the decrease in price is big enough that investment increases to take advantage of that change in price. So think of electric car plants. Um, so you want to think about just incorporating that price correctly and having everybody respond to that price. Uh, we have lots of off-model ways of thinking about how to how to project productivity growth. So maybe thinking about the effect of total factor productivity just in the energy sector, but aggregating up from the renewable and non-renewable, uh, and how that then affects overall productivity. Um, and uh, a couple of other ways that you want to think about the distribution, you know, both to think about the distributional effects but then outside the model, but then also think about how to get them correctly uh, into the model in aggregate. I, I should say, Steve Braun, you were you were invoked many times <laughs> in our conversation of what would what would we what would we suggest to Steve. Um, so thinking about the labor share, um, we have lots of experience as modelers thinking about the labor share in different sectors, thinking about the labor share in the manufacturing sector and the service sector, in different parts of the manufacturing sector and how those have changed over time. And then what we think about then the labor share going forward. So you might similarly do that, thinking about the labor share in the energy sector uh, and in other sectors and how labor reallocation uh, will matter for the labor share. And then making sure you have all of the effects of trade in terms of trade um, to help, to help uh, incorporate it into the model. There are, so that was one big way that we thought about how to incorporate these changes into an aggregate model, being careful about the distributional effects uh, along the way. Uh, there are past experiences that can help us to calibrate, you know, or at least how to inform how to model this. So we talked about like what you might think of as the China shock, uh, which I would characterize as a reduction in cost of imported final goods and how that affected manufacturing in the US. But then sitting here typing that up, I thought maybe it was, it's better to think about uh, also because of trade, a reduction in cost of inputs. And there I had in mind like semiconductor chips. So maybe think about how the reduction in the cost of semiconductor chips and you know you got to do some quality adjustment there because it's not just that, right? I mean, chips today are not the same as chips from 20 years ago. How that created just a massive change in the way we produce things in the United States. Uh, so you can look at these big past transitions and and decide whether or not um, it was a problem uh, just looking at aggregates or whether whether or not you had to get under the hood. Okay, then I'm going to come to. The, the risk word in the part of transition risks. Um, and the way I thought about this and people sort of seem to buy is that uh, there are both intended and unintended consequences of this transition. So an intended consequence would be like, we fully intend through this transition for fossil, fossil fuel assets to become less valuable. Like that's just an intended consequence. An unintended consequence, what we don't intend but will happen unless policy mitigates it or undoes it. Uh, I mean, actually the one I'm about to explain 
is just an unintended consequence that, that would happen is that workers in the fossil fuel industry would face a need to switch industries. Um, so you need to think about what the intended consequences are, what the unintended consequences are, and then how policy wants to lean into those, mitigate those, prevent those. Um, and then somewhat similarly expected and unexpected consequences. So unexpected consequence would be, we fully expect that we're gonna need a significant amount of construction and non-renewable infrastructure. And that will create land use issues. Like there are all sorts of things that we fully expect are gonna be consequences of this transition that we need to think about in the models. Then they're all, and, and we, we also fully expect, I think, that this transition is going to change geopolitical power dynamics. But then there are unexpected consequences. Um, and just because things may go wrong, there may be shortages, there may be price spikes. You know, here I was thinking about like intraday price spikes in particular, like it turns out not everybody wants to use, you know, energy when the sun's up. Um, and then of course there are unknown unknowns. And so you want to incorporate, this is the true idea of transition risks. You want to be thoughtful of what these risks are. And then beyond all of this, I feel like everything that I just talked about started with current law. Uh, you might, if you're not, if you're not, you know, the administration trying to create its forecast, you want to think about policy risk. Um, and that um, policy risk can also add to the transition both, uh, I mean, I, when I was saying that out loud, I meant domestic, but then it occurred to me that we may as well think about global policy risk as well. All right, thank you, Wendy. And then we have one more group, um, this last one, uh, the public and financial sector risk and response, who I think is repertoired by Eric. And if I can ask you to try to be brief so we can get to our last panel. I'm gonna be great. super brief, especially since the previous group encroached on our space. <laughs> yeah, policy risk is very important. Okay, there we go. Um, one thing I just wanna start with was something that came up at the end which is that at least in our sample of four researchers, we couldn't identify scholarly work that focuses on how uncertainty about future climate pro provides fiscal risk at federal agency and state level. There's literature on fiscal risk. There's literature on climate, but there isn't a literature on that ties those two together with, that we are aware of. And a couple of folks in the group had been looking rather intently. So this is, this is something to pay attention to. And as a result uh, of that, so this is, this is just a kind of a large area. Moreover, there's the issue of transmission of risk from one level of government to the other. Um, and that raised, came back to a couple of our key questions. Who is paying now, <laughs> since these are, perhaps, you know, uh, uncosted risks and who should be. Um, we covered a, a number of different topics, uh, but I'm just going to um, jump to the risk between, uh, of the strong divergence between audiences and actors. So this is, this is a, a, a part of the policy public risk um, is that communicating these is vulnerable to very different reactions to what we're communicating. And that is in, particularly tr in particular true, as Rachel Cletus emphasized earlier, on talking about risk. There's a risk in talking about risk because people don't understand it. Um, and one other that I'm going to mention is that there is a risk that modest GDP deltas translates, and this is what we've been talking about the whole time, translates into serious uh, local and regional impacts. So this is just for interpreting models. We have a lot more though, oh my gosh, it's just beautiful. There's lots of stuff. Thank you. All right, thank you everyone. I will now turn it over to Bob and the the we have three panelists for this final discussion to just kind of have an open discussion trying to trying to synthesize some of the the discussions that came up um, in the past two days.